we're all excited today, Darren, because we just did a program on seeds and how they are dispersed throughout nature. So the kids were making connections to this session because we know that this is about poop. <laughs> so, Fantastic. <laughs> well, that I is know. certainly one way that seeds are distributed uh, around my yard, especially. We used to have a whole lot of um, black bear activity coming through our yard. And every year I would wonder what my kids left in the yard until I realized that it was a black bear that left that in my yard, not a child. Um, but it's all full of berry seeds uh, in the fall. So uh, that is definitely a way that seeds are distributed. Um, and in the case of bears, a whole lot of seeds are distributed. Uh, Okay, so all over, over to you right. and talk about the scoop on poop. Fantastic. All right, well, we're not talking about uh, animals that eat things with seeds in them necessarily today. Uh, we're going to be learning about stellar sea lions. And if you see the big giant one behind me, his name is Pilot. Uh, if you see a smaller one, I'll have to take a closer look to figure out which one it is. But that is definitely Pilot uh, that just swam behind me. He is close to 2,000 pounds now. And stellar sea lions are the largest species of sea lion in the world. And that's what this program is all about. So welcome to the Alaska Sea Life Center, everyone. Uh, Mally, maybe you can tell me, do we have some, some new folks or is everybody, uh, are these all kids who have already connected to us once before, do you know? I would say half and half. Half and half, all right. Well, I'm gonna show you a quick video of some of the animals that we have here at the Alaska Sea Life Center for the benefit of those who have not connected to us yet. And uh, if you have, and this is just a quick review, I'm fast forwarding for a moment here. <clears throat> so the Alaska Sea Life Center is a place where folks can come from around the world to learn about our animals that live here in Alaska's oceans, like seals. We've got spotted seals and ring seals, these stellar sea lions that we're talking about today. And we have a habitat with diving seabirds in it as well. Uh, puffins, guillemots, murres, auklets, and sea ducks. You get to watch those birds flying underwater. We've got about five, or sorry, 4,000 animals total uh, here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Most of them are fish and invertebrates, animals without backbones like sea stars and anemones and crabs and urchins, cucumbers, chitons. Uh, we've got a touch pool upstairs where you get to put your hands into the freezing cold water and feel some of those animals. Uh, we're hoping to open back up to the public very soon here to get folks coming in to visit with these animals again. Uh, ordinarily, we'd have kids sleeping on the floor today. Uh, they would have just woken up a few hours ago uh, right here in the exhibits. Uh, we also have an animal rescue program here. We rescue injured and stranded marine mammals from all over the state of Alaska. And if we can, we'll get them back out into the wild if it's possible. Otherwise, we'll find them another permanent home uh, at another zoo or aquarium around the country or around the world in some cases. And finally, what we're discovering today is the Alaska Sea Life Center has a team of scientists. And the scientists are working to understand what's going on out there in Alaska's ocean ecosystems. So. Uh, they use all sorts of different tools and technologies. Some of them even take their work underwater. So we've got a few folks who are trained as scientific divers and are able to do science underwater. Let me know, would you like to do science underwater? Yes or no? All right. That's what I like to see. Mally, it's never too late to uh, start a new career. I bet the kids would miss you though if you if you dove into scientific diving instead of uh, remote education services. All right, so <clears throat> it looks like a lot of folks said yes. There was one person who said no thanks, uh, very polite, and it's not for everyone for sure to spend time underwater uh, on scuba, and uh, it is a unique experience. Uh, if you get the opportunity to try it out, to see what it's like to go scuba diving, I recommend it. Um, I personally enjoy it somewhat, but I prefer to just do things under my own power and uh, hold my breath, snorkel, 
free dive down and come back up and I know I'm done uh, when I'm when I need to breathe again. Uh, it creeps me out a little bit to be breathing underwater, to be honest, but it is fun. It is a cool way to experience the underwater world. So uh, I take that for what it is. So today we're going to focus on these animals here, the stellar sea lions. And as I mentioned, these are the largest sea lions in the world. So what we're going to do first is just talk a little bit about their biology and why we study them. And then we're going to dive into their poop, just a little. Uh, so again, this guy's name is Pilot. He is growing right now, getting bigger and bigger. And uh, he will likely approach 2,000 pounds, uh, not quite 1,000 kilograms. Uh, this springtime, but stellar sea lion males in the springtime get very, very big so that they can defend a territory against other males. So let's see, uh, apart from pilot here, uh, let's see what a few other sea lion behaviors are. They do like to get out of the water from time to time, and they're quite capable climbers. They can get up on these steep, rocky shorelines around Alaska, and that gives them access to places where they might want to haul out to rest. And that's most of what they do when they're out of the water. Uh, those big heavy bodies and their flippers, they're not exactly long distance runners, but they are, uh, again, very capable of moving around on those rocks when they need to. Uh, I see a question there, growing indeed. It's kind of bizarre, uh, but let me show you why here. So those big male stellar sea lions like that every year uh, would like to defend a territory out on the breeding area, the rookery, where females are going to come out to give birth to their pups. So very soon here, actually probably already out there in the wild this year, early May, uh, those big males are going to go out and start staking out a spot on that island. And they're hoping to breed with any females that show up out there. They will fight with rival males to defend a territory. At some point, uh, a male will likely lose his territory sometime in the summer. But his aim, his goal, is to keep that territory throughout the entire summer breeding season. What that means is from the beginning of May till sometime in August, these males will not be eating because all of their food is in the ocean. So for three or four months, they will not consume any food. And that means they're going to lose a huge amount of weight over the course of the summer. So not only do they need to be big to defend a territory against other males, they also need to be big just simply because they're going to lose about 400 kilograms of their body mass over the course of the summer. So in the springtime, uh, big males like pilot will be growing and then they'll get to a peak weight, their maximum weight. Sometime uh, for pilot, he doesn't have to get out there and compete at the beginning of May, so uh, he can keep eating as long as he wants to. But toward the end of May, usually, he will reach a maximum weight for the year and then he just stops eating because he's not interested. His body turns off his desire to eat and he will lose a lot of that weight over the course of the summer. So. A full-grown male stellar sea lion, full adult size, might be up to about 1,200 kilograms uh, in the springtime. And then by the fall, they would be back down to about 800 kilograms. So they're going to lose, again, about 400 kilograms over the course of the summer. So pilot is still growing. It's pretty bizarre. He eats about 30 kilograms a day right now and mostly fish. So let's take a look at... Uh, what it looks like when a stellar sea lion eats a fish. See how they consume their food here. We're going to start with a little training session. You'll see in this session. Uh, I'm going to pause for just a moment. Hey, Mally. Looks like your audio is on. I'm getting a little background noise. There we go. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so this video shows you a large stellar sea lion consuming very tiny fish. And uh, when we feed them small fish, we just have to feed them a lot more. So this guy's name was Woody. Woody passed away back in 2015. He had been here at the Alaska Sea Life Center for most of his life uh, since he was five years old. You 
can see he was a pretty big fella, about the same size that Pilot is now in this video, but Woody grew to be almost 1,200 kilograms uh, at his full size, and he died at the age of 22, which is very old for a stellar sea lion, uh, especially a male. They don't normally live to be past about uh, 18 years old out there in the wild. And you can see these animals are capable of lots of different behaviors. We train them not only uh, for exercise, but also so that we can take care of these animals uh, better. So we want them to lift up various parts of their bodies, open their mouths, blow their noses, things that you might ask, uh, say, a child to do to inspect their bodies and make sure they're healthy when you can't ask the child what's wrong. So if we want to know that every part of their bodies is still working, we just ask them to move those parts. And they do that, they'll go from place to place uh, on request, and that helps us to take uh, very good care of these animals. Uh, yes, and again, Woody, uh, he died at a, a very old age, and um, he had a fantastic life here at the Alaska Sea Life Center and taught us a huge amount about stellar sea lions. Here he is again. You can hear they're super loud, these big guys. And in this video, you'll see what it looks like when they eat a little bit bigger fish. This is going to be uh, Woody eating a salmon, which is about the size of my whole arm. Let's see how he eats it. All right. Pretty much the same way they ate the little tiny ones. Uh, they just catch their food and swallow it whole for the most part because the teeth that they have are made for catching. They're very sharp and pointy, but they don't have molars for chewing and taking bites of their food like we would do. So stellar sea lions simply catch and they swallow. They have a really big throat. A uh, big male stellar sea lion, like the size of pilot here, could swallow a fish that's about as big around as my head. So that would be a uh, fish that would weigh mm, potentially like eight to 10 kilograms. They could just swallow it whole. Because they swallow their food whole, uh, in their scat, in their poop, it's not all ground up and chewed up. Uh, there are whole pieces of things that will come out. And so that gives us a valuable tool uh, for studying stellar sea lions. Now I'm gonna go uh, for just a moment here and talk about the stellar sea lion population as a whole. So first of all, we have the overall range of this species. Stellar sea lions can be found across the North Pacific, basically from Japan, right over here through Russia, across through the Bering Sea, and on over into Alaska and down south along the west coast of North America. But just across the North Pacific, that's the whole range of the stellar sea lions. Now all those little red triangles you see are rookeries. Those are places where they give birth and raise their pups. So clearly very important locations. Most of those are throughout the Bering Sea and on over into Russia uh, and in the uh, southeastern Alaska portion of the range. You see that line that divides right through the middle there. Uh, that's between the eastern population and the western population. Those two populations of stellar sea lions do not mix very much. Uh, and so scientists look at these populations separately. Back in the 1990s, these populations were both listed, uh, they were originally listed as a threatened species, and then when they divided into the eastern and western populations and looked at them separately, the western population was listed as endangered. So how can you tell me, uh, or what does uh, an endangered species mean? What does it mean when we say a species is endangered? Tell me what that means. possibility of going extinct, right? So what it really means is their population has gone down uh, so far, so fast to a, such a low number that we feel like if human beings don't do something different, maybe give that species extra protection or stop doing something that we're doing. If we don't change something, we anticipate that that species might just go extinct altogether. So they've gotten to a point where we don't think they'll just fix it, fix it themselves. 
we feel like we need to do something extra. Uh, and so the government puts that distinction on a population of animals and then they get extra protection, extra um, energy and effort toward researching that animal, trying to understand it, looking at which areas of their habitat are really critical and maybe establishing places where humans cannot go and restricting human activity around those animals. But really we wanna understand more about those animals so that we can help prevent them from going extinct and hopefully help their population to recover. So this is what uh, the stellar sea lion population looked like uh, back in 1978. This is uh, our local rookery. So a place again where they gather to give birth and raise their pups and you can see this is an island with very steep rocks. Imagine giving birth on the side of a really steep hill that just leads straight into the ocean. Uh, <clears throat> seems like a terrible idea for us, but for stellar sea lions, it works. And you can see there's adult sea lions all across this whole island. Probably about 200 animals in this image. And that was in August of 1978. We fast forward 20 years to the height of their population decline in July of 1998, you can see on that same island, it is mostly empty rock. There are a few animals scattered here and there, but maybe about 40 animals. And that's about 80% of their population that uh, disappeared. Now this is just one island. So of course, part of uh, understanding that population change is looking at multiple locations. And scientists did that. And across the population of stellar sea lions, we saw very similar declines. No one really knows why. For a long time, we were trying to understand why are these stellar sea lions disappearing? At this point, we've gotten far enough along that their population went way down and just stayed very low. And so here's what that looked like uh, in a graph form. This was in the mid 80s here when we really started noticing that decline and it dropped so steeply. Uh, scientists were extremely concerned and reached a very low level, but then that has stayed basically flat. So uh, this is from a place called Marmot Island. And you can see we're up around 10,000 at the highest number there back in the 70s. We didn't have a lot of data because there were plenty of stellar sea lions, but then starting in the 80s there, they started watching really closely and that number just plummeted down to below 1,000 animals. So that's actually over a 90% decline in this particular, on this particular island. But again, it stayed flat. So it didn't just disappear altogether, uh, but that's certainly cause for concern with this population of animals. So scientists have been studying these animals for decades now, trying to get a better understanding of them. We've done lots of different studies, including having some of them here at the Alaska Sea Life Center and in a few other facilities where they're able to study those animals really closely for a long period of time. But we also need to understand the wild animals. So we have remote camera systems set up. We do studies on the availability of fish species. We do studies on what the stellar sea lions are eating so that we can learn, well, there these fish are available and this is what they're eating. Does that match up well? Are we taking too many of certain types of fish uh, that might be making it harder for stellar sea lions to get what they need or really want? Are they having to dive deeper than they used to work harder to find fish? What's going on? So looking at their diet is a huge part of studying these animals uh, biology and their behavior. It is a little challenging because they can just eat their fish underwater. So it's not like we can just watch them do it. So collecting their scat is a valuable tool for scientists to be able to study stellar sea lions. And I'm gonna show you today then how we look at the scat of stellar sea lions and what kind of information we can learn from that. So uh, the first step is not the most fun. Well, the, technically the first step is collecting the scat. I don't have that video. But once the scat has been collected, it needs to be cleaned before we can analyze it. And so this step 
is highly personal and um, each scat sample can take multiple hours to clean this way. Uh, not necessarily everyone's favorite job, but it is kind of like a little scavenger hunt and it's sort of a necessary process. We play fun music to make it a little bit less uh, painful along the way. <clears throat> and now you'll, you'll see here this researcher is using gloves. That's because he is working with a scat sample from a wild stellar sea lion. We don't know what kind of diseases this animal may have had. We don't even know which sea lion this came from. We just picked it up off a rock with a shovel and put it into a baggie. But you'll see, he's going to use a lot of water. They've used some soap to kind of break it up also. And now he's going to use a little paintbrush to just gently brush those pieces against these strainers, these metal sieves. And there's a stack of them with smaller and smaller holes so that he can collect all the littlest, tiniest parts. But the water is flushing away all of the soft matter. Anything that smells bad is going down the drain here, uh, which is great. But he's also getting these other parts very, very clean and concentrated so that we can see just what was in there. And so we're looking at just the hard parts that are left in these scat samples. Scat is poop indeed, yes. And you can see he's just trying to remove as much of the water as possible to get down to just those hard parts without all the water. No. So it's going to be very, very clean. You still wouldn't want to eat it, of course. It came from poop. But it's nice and clean. It's not smelly, but it's still all wet. So now we're going to take that and put it into a drying oven. A drying oven is just a fancy oven that can keep a nice warm temperature for several days as that scat dries out. So we're not cooking it, but we're keeping it nice and warm to drive out all of the moisture, all the water that's in there. So now we have this preserved scat sample. And it's a lot smaller than it used to be. Won't smell like anything. Uh, and it's just, again, those dried hard parts that are left over after we've flushed everything else away. So that's the process of cleaning the scat samples. And uh, some scientists have cleaned thousands of these stellar sea lion scat samples over the course of their careers. Uh, the guy in the video there, Jason Waite, was a graduate student. Um, at the time when he did a lot of that work and he was focused on um, how can we learn from those scat samples. So one thing that he was doing was collecting scat samples literally from here to Russia, uh, as many as he could in as many locations as he could uh, afford to do it. And another thing that he was doing was taking fish samples from those areas and chemically breaking down those fish so that he could look at when you take that fish and digest it, what do the body parts left over look like? So he created these reference guides of pieces that you might find left over after you digested a fish. And <clears throat> now we have this reference collection. We can go out and collect scat samples and we can start to see, oh, it looks like stellar seedlings are eating this. So I'm going to show you some of the hard parts that we can find in these stellar sea lion scat samples, and a little bit about the process of analyzing the scat. Where did I find my tweezers? There we go. Uh, let's see, this looks a little too bright on my screen, so I'm gonna darken it up just a hair here. Try to make it a little bit clearer. And I'm gonna zoom in just a little, so you can see uh, the technique that we use first is to sort the scat sample. So I'm going to try to find things that look similar and make little piles of them. And as I do that, I may or may not be able to identify these things right away. Uh, some things I can, some things I can't. I can see these big giant white things. I'm going to go ahead and make a stack of those. So this sorting step is important because it's going to make it easier to find some of those recognizable parts uh, in the scat sample. So I'm going to go ahead and sort a few of these things. 
and I'll get your input on what you think they are in just a moment. We'll just pull out a few more here. And we'll talk about how each part can help us understand what these sea lions have been eating. Now you notice I'm not wearing gloves. This was a sample from our resident stellar sea lions. And like I showed before, we train them to do all sorts of behaviors so that we can ensure that they stay healthy. And because they get regular veterinary care, uh, we know that they don't have any just dangerous kind of bizarre diseases that might uh, might be dangerous to us. Now it is still um, from the scat of an animal, uh, so I will uh, wash my hands certainly afterwards. But just like cleaning up after your dog or cat uh, at home, it's an animal that's not necessarily unknown. When you're working with wild animals and their scat, it can be far more dangerous. Certainly, our domestic animals can have illnesses that would be dangerous to us, but that would be much more rare than a wild animal that could have something uh, that could be hazardous to humans. So with, with wild stellar sea lion scat, we have to be a lot more careful. All right, so I've got a few different piles here. I'm gonna zoom in on individual things and see what you guys think they are. So here we have little spherical objects. Let me see if my camera is gonna cooperate. Let's zoom out just a little bit and try again here. There we go. Much nicer. Okay, so what do you think these are? Little round things. These are, um, they're not all from fish, I'll be honest, but they are all the same body part. What piece of a fish do you think these things might be? Totally round. I've got eyes and eggs and eyes and eyes. These are indeed eye lenses. Now, our eye lenses are kind of flat. Um, sort of a disc-like shape, but these eye lenses are spherical and they work a little bit differently. Now these animals see underwater, so their eyes function differently from ours. This one here down at the bottom is from a fish and you see it's kind of splitting apart in different sections. This one here is the same, but this one over here that looks kind of clear is actually from a squid. So squid eye lenses and fish eye lenses look a little bit different. Now, of course, uh, each fish or squid would have two eye lenses, a left and a right. And you can see here with these two fish eye lenses, they're slightly different sizes. So chances are pretty high that those are from two different fish. Um, but if I had a set of eye lenses that were all about the same size and I wasn't really sure, um, like these two here, they're about the same size, those could have come from the same fish. But one fish could only have up to two eyes, right? So I can use these to estimate sort of relative numbers between fish and squid. Uh, it looks like they're eating more fish than squid. I've got one squid eye lens, four fish eye lenses, or pieces of them anyway. So I've got at least two fish, maybe three, maybe four, um, but I've only got representation of one squid. So with things like eye lenses, where there's a left and a right, they can use those to start looking at numbers of things. Here is another part of a fish. What does this look like? Zoom way in on that one. What part of a fish would this be? A scale, very good. Now, not all scales are this uh, big and round. I'll put the edge of my tweezers next to it there. This is actually a pretty good size scale, pretty big. Um, and I can tell just by the size and because this is an animal that we fed, um, I know the different fish species that we feed to our animals here at the Sea Life Center. This is from a herring. Uh, 
And just by the shape and size, researchers might be able to tell from a scale, a single scale, what type of fish this sea lion had eaten. Uh, in the case here at the Sea Life Center, there are only about maybe five different fish species that we feed. And so I can look at that right away and say that's a herring scale. I'm definitely not an expert, um, but it's pretty simple with so few to choose from. Uh, if I were looking at a wild stellar sea lion scat sample, I would really have to know a lot more about the available fish species and what their scales might look like. Here we have another part. Uh, and again, this is not from a fish. This is from a squid. Does anybody know what part of a squid this is? is indeed a squid beak. There's another one. So there are two parts and squid beaks come with a top and a bottom. Uh, these are both a little bit broken, but they both look like they're the same. Uh, I can't actually tell. I think that's the bottom of the beak. So I've got two different uh, squid represented here. Uh, and again, because these come in pairs, a top and a bottom, we might be able to pair them up and get an estimate of at least how many squid the sea lion ate. We could say, you know, it ate at least three if we found uh, five beak parts, or if we found three bottoms or three tops, we would know that had to come from at least three squid. All right, here's another one. Uh, these are from fish. And they are bones. Does anybody know which part of the body these bones represent? Vertebrae, very good. Yes, squid do have beaks. It is super cool. All right. <clears throat> uh, these are various vertebrae. And here we can see there's a bunch of smaller ones. Those could have all come from the same fish potentially, although the color might indicate they were digested differently or started out as slightly different colors. These could have all come from the same fish potentially, but these much bigger ones are almost certainly from another fish. But each fish might have 30 or 40 vertebrae so this isn't going to help me understand how many of something they've been eating necessarily. But it could help me understand which types uh, experts could tell. Now, something that can definitely help us understand which types and even sizes of fish are these objects here. What do you think these might be, these large white things? These are all from one type of fish. What part of the fish do you think they might be? Give me just a moment. I'm actually preparing a fish to uh, bring out. So that we can see what part of the fish it came from. Let's <laughs> see, tail, backbone. Nope, backbone might have been from before. Uh, is that how they catch their food? The beak. Uh, the beak is how they break into their food with back to the squid squid there. All right, so we've got tail and I have no idea. I'm gonna show you where these things come from in a fish called a walleye pollock. It's a type of cod. And here it is. So we're gonna do a brief dissection here. I'm just gonna cut open one part of our cod here. And uh, incidentally, if you're not sure what walleye pollock are, um, look on a box of fish sticks and you'll typically see that those were made from pollock here in Alaska. This is actually the species of fish that we catch more of uh, than any other for people to eat. So it's a very, very common fish. All the fish at McDonald's is made from uh, walleye pollock, typically from Alaska. And uh, it's a huge fishery. So I'm going to cut right into the top of the skull here, just a little bit, just enough so that I can open it up. And we look down inside there, 
This one was a little bit tricky, so I'm not positive if I hit the right spot here. It had some weird markings on it, which were misleading to me. Let's see if I got lucky. Down inside there, we should find these two large white things. There we go. Here's one of them. And that just came right out. It was not attached to anything. Here's the other. These objects are called otoliths. And oto means ear. <laughs> uh, lith means stone. So these are actually ear stones. They are not part of the skeleton. Again, they're not attached to anything. If anybody has ever told you you have rocks in your head, uh, not super polite sounding, but that's actually true. We have otoliths too. Uh, and ours are used for balance, but in the case of fish, they're used for not only balance, but also hearing. These stones help the fish to sense vibrations in the water. So they basically have these rocks just kind of floating in these pockets of fluid in their heads. And when sound vibrations come through, these otoliths vibrate and shake inside there which is why when they tell you not to tap on the glass of an aquarium tank with the fish in there, they're very sensitive to those vibrations. They literally have rocks shaking around in their heads when those vibrations come through. So uh, it can be very damaging to those fish to have those loud noises in the water. Uh, Darren, how big of a fish does see, that come oh, from? Ah, glad you asked because they seem big. This is a tool that scientists use uh, to estimate the sizes of fish because as the fish grow, their otoliths grow too. Uh, I think I have a tape measure still here. Let me check real quick. Should be one in here. Yep. Okay. So <clears throat> what they'll do is measure from the base of the tail, the fleshy part there, uh, to the very tip of the fish's head. So in this case, the fish is about 27 centimeters long uh, total. That's the total length of the fish. And these otoliths are, I'm going to say, 13 millimeters. So 13 millimeter otoliths on a 27 centimeter fish. And <clears throat> what scientists do is they measure those fish, uh, lots of them. And then they look at the relationship between the size of the otolith and the size of the fish. So just like I just did, scientists will take those measurements. And so mine was, uh, let me brighten that up a little bit, a 13 millimeter otolith right there and a 27 centimeter fish right there. So the data point for that particular otolith would be right here. And it happens to be right on this line that's drawn, but really when scientists sampled all those fish, they got all sorts of numbers like this. And then they drew this line through the middle of them so that if we find an otolith, we can measure the otolith and then use this graph with this line now to estimate the size of the fish overall. This happened to be, the one that I just measured, happened to land right on the line, but it could have been some distance from the line, but it gives you a good estimate of the size of the fish uh, that the sea lion ate. And it's not just the size that we can tell. Right away, uh, from an otolith, we can determine what species of fish these sea lions have been eating. So you can see here, these are otoliths from walleye pollock, like I just showed. Let me get this back in focus. And if I slide it right up to the top here, we're gonna see an otolith from a very different fish, a herring. You see that little tiny one right up at the top. That's from a herring. And although these pollock are generally larger fish, Herring otoliths, compared to the size of their body, are extremely small. Pollock otoliths tend to be pretty big uh, compared to the size of their body. And so here's this herring otolith. The scale from the herring was huge, but I just happen to know herring have really big scales. The pollock scales would be about one quarter the size there. Um, so 
each fish is going to have a different shape and size to its otolith compared to its body. Uh, another one down here, this is actually from a salmon, which was almost certainly bigger than all of these pollock up here, but the salmon otoliths are very small. So you can see this very different shape of each of these different species and the size will have a different relationship again uh, for each species. So as scientists look at these otoliths, uh, they will look at the shape to determine the species, and then they can determine this, the size of the fish based on the length of that otolith. Inside the otolith, there's even more information about the fish themselves. They sort of grow like trees um, with little rings in them. And <clears throat> uh, I see Gabby can't see. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, so that Inside those otoliths, you can see growth rings like a tree would have, and they can estimate the age of a fish uh, from these otoliths as well. Here is what that could look like. And uh, you can see these rings appearing in there. Uh, that's looking through the center of the otolith, um, a little slice of it via a microscope. So you can see those growth rings that help scientists to determine the age of the fish that these sea lions have been eating. All right, so now I've got another question for you. You see all those little purple flecks inside this scat sample. This scat sample was cleaned in a similar fashion to what I showed you in the video. And again, this was from our, uh, one of our resident stellar sea lions. What do you think the purple stuff is? Let me show you how big it is compared to my tweezers. Evidently, that might be a Pollock scale right there. A little tiny one, a little piece of one there. All right, we've got plastic. I think they might actually be plastic. Um, scales, they're not scales. I don't know if any fish would have scales that color. Um, they are actually human-made material, uh, glitter. So now my next question is why on earth would there be glitter stellar sea lion scat sample. Uh, remember for a moment that this, this scat is from one of our stellar sea lions here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. And why would there be glitter in it, do you think? <clears throat> Any idea? Why glitter? I have to start giving you some clues. Do we feed them glitter? Yes, we fed it to them. That was gonna be my next clue. We actually fed them the glitter. Uh, and it's easy to do because they swallow their fish whole. If we ever need to give these animals vitamins or medicine or anything like that, we can simply have a little pill, stick it behind the gill of the fish. Um, so just tuck it inside the opening there. And when they swallow the fish, it just goes in. They don't even notice. They don't have any idea that they just swallowed a pill. Uh, so it's these little, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's these little pills that we have filled with glitter and the pill dissolves and then the glitter is inside their digestive tract. So why would we feed them glitter? We don't do it very often. Um, we're not currently feeding anybody glitter, to my knowledge. So here's my next question then. Uh, let's say your neighbor's dog is pooping in your yard, but you have four different neighbors and all of them have dogs. How do you know which neighbor to talk to to ask them to keep their dog in their own yard? To make sure their digestive system is working. That's a good thought. 
uh, from Mali. Uh, you could use certain substances to track like how quickly things move through an animal's digestive system. Um, I'm not sure that glitter would be the substance of choice. They might use something more of a liquid and then do an x-ray or look at uh, a tracer of, of um, some kind of marker like that to see how fast it's moving through. I um, think they got it. <laughs> to tell who pooed, exactly. <laughs> If you fed each of your neighbor's dogs a different color of glitter, then when the green sparkles show up in your yard, you know which neighbor to talk to, to ask them to keep their dog on their own property. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. So with our stellar sea lions, we're not trying to find out what they've been eating. We fed it to them, right? We know exactly what they ate. We fed it to them, we watched them eat it. And so we're not, it's no mystery when they poop it out, we know exactly what they ate. Uh, and how much even, we can use that to establish like, okay, if we feed them 10 pounds of salmon and five pounds of herring, then their scat comes out the other end. What does that look like? So then we can compare that to wild animals. But in this case, remember, remember back to the scat cleaning video where the scientist was flushing all of that stuff down the drain and saving only the hard parts. Well, there's information in the soft stuff too. Everything that he hosed down the drain, his study was just not looking at those things. In some cases, they'll take what's called a subsample. So they'll take a little bit of that scat and keep the soft matter because they usually only need a little tiny bit of it. And then they can keep the rest for all the hard parts. Uh, and that soft matter can contain things like DNA of the sea lion itself. Uh, and then chemical substances from the animal's body, chemicals like hormones. Hormones are chemicals that run through the body, through the bloodstream and uh, <clears throat> regulate processes in the body. So control how fast we do things or how fast our body processes food or um, if we get scared or stressed out, there will be different hormones running through our body, all these different chemicals that control processes in the body. And those chemicals just come out in various ways. They're excreted. Uh, so scat is one way that we can look at the hormones in the animal's body. And that's one of the things that we have done with our female stellar sea lions in particular in the past. We were looking at when could they become pregnant? How can we tell if they are pregnant? Uh, what changes do we see in their hormone levels throughout the year? So in order to do that, we would need to track one animal for a very long time. And they live here, but we don't just follow them around with a Ziploc baggie waiting for them to poop. Sometimes we do that. Uh, most of the time, we would just find a scat sample and say, oh, whose is that? And so uh, if we need a sample from a particular animal, then if we can mark them with glitter, that gives us a permanent, easily identifiable marker for their scat. And we can, we can just pick it up off the deck or in the case of underwater when we're diving to clean the habitat. If the scientists needed a sample from a particular animal, they would hand me a baggie and say, Darren, collect us a green sample. I'd swim down, put that sample into a baggie, bring it back up to the dive tender, hand it off and we're good to go. So the glitter was a marker. Um, and each animal would get a different color of glitter. So, yeah, your neighbor. I'm uh, not a fan of my neighbor's dogs. I don't even know how many of them there are. People walk their dogs through the whole neighborhood and we get a wide variety showing up in our yard, but we don't have a dog. So it's a lot of cleanup that I don't feel like I should have to do. Uh, I wish I could just feed them all glitter and know who to talk to about it. <laughs> Might not be the best way to, to be a good neighbor though. I'm gonna try to be tolerant. All right, uh, so let's see what questions you all have for the last few minutes. So type your questions into the chat and I'll um, watch them as they go by. I'm gonna go ahead and focus on the habitat there. See if Pilot keeps coming around. It's a really bright sunny day, which is awesome, but it does make it a little harder to see the animal. So what questions do you have about stellar sea lions or their scat uh, or Alaska? Anything you're curious about? Uh, 
Um, how old is the oldest sea lion you have? Uh, I always forget. Uh, Mara, who happens to be pregnant, um, and we could be giving birth any time now. I'm not sure exactly what our closest estimate is nowadays. Um, <clears throat> Mara is, I think she's 17, or will be 17, if that's right. That sounds right in my head. Uh, yes, I believe Mara is 17 from 2003. Um, but she's quite a bit smaller than Pilot. She's only about one quarter his size, uh, maybe a third his size. Uh, <clears throat> how warm is the water? The water here is about five degrees Celsius, um, five to 10 degrees Celsius, I should say. Uh, and it comes from about 100 meters underwater. So it stays a pretty consistent temperature throughout the year. Uh, how old can a stellar sea lion get? The males in the wild tip tend to live to be 15 to 18 years old. The females may be up to about 20 years old. Um, and of course, in human care, they typically will live longer because nothing is chasing them or eating them. Uh, they have plenty of food and um, regular medical care so that we can, we can keep them going quite a bit longer. Uh, Mally, I can try to remember to send you a picture. If you watch our Facebook, um, that would be the best way. But uh, if I think about it, there will be a press release um, when that kind of information goes out. And um, I can try to remember. But again, that might not be maybe anywhere from now through into July. And so uh, my memory being what it is, <laughs> I can try to remember. That's that. okay. That we'll join your email. Facebook page. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, if you watch our Facebook, there's Facebook all Facebook kinds page. of fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, Tanya wants to know, do you guys feed them only fish? Oh, uh, nowadays, Better. yes. Um, we used to feed them octopus, but that was many years ago. So truth be told, the squid beaks in my scat sample, I put them there. Um, that's something that they might eat in the wild for sure, but um, uh, we haven't actually been feeding our stellar sea lion squid for some time. We used to give them octopus, and it was really cool because the octopus here in Alaska can get super big, like as big as I am. And uh, that's a little too much to swallow at once. So a sea lion will uh, catch an octopus, and then they just grab it in their mouth and shake it like a dog toy until pieces just go flying, uh, just tear apart. And so then they have maybe one arm that's one or two meters long, and then they just get part of it in their mouth, and then they just keep wiggling their head back and forth at the surface until it falls into their throat. Imagine eating a spaghetti noodle that was like that big around and two meters long, floating in the water with no arms or fork. <laughs> it seems really gross to us, but they don't have a gag reflex like we do. So, I mean, they, they swallow their food whole, so they wouldn't be able to if, uh, if they didn't have that. Uh, but yeah, to, so to swallow this giant long octopus arm is, uh, it's not weird to them at all. It's weird to us to watch for sure. Uh, pretty bizarre, but they love it. And well, in some cases, uh, scientists have found that octopus might even make up as much as 25% of their diet uh, in certain areas, certain times, you know, but that's just all part of this study. You know, it's a huge ocean out there to try to track what these animals are eating, how and where. It's really complicated. And so the, the more different ways we can look at this, this puzzle, uh, the more we can learn. Well, that was amazing. Um, I hadn't seen this session before, Katie had, and just the chat, reading the students' chat, they were amazed and I grossed out and engaged <laughs> all at the same time and i'm really Thanks. impressed that the students remembered the names of the when you did the squid dissection and they're actually gonna um see yep. something else at the vancouver aquarium soon so that they remembered that from your last session so we'll look forward to the next one on tide pools and i'm pretty sure we'll book this one again because it was real would you guys like to see this one again I, cause it was great. It was so great.
Yeah, so maybe we'll do this one in the summer and I think we should join um, your Facebook page so we can find out when that baby's born. For sure. And on mm -hmm. our YouTube channel, I keep plugging this, but if you go to our YouTube channel um, on the Education Corner playlist, it's got all of these videos we've been producing over the last couple months. And one of them is uh, a scientist who is currently, it's actually probably right now, back there in the lab cleaning scat samples. So you can see what Kara is up to. Wow. Um, so there's a video directly related to what we just saw. Uh, but a more recent one, that one that we that I showed during the session today was an older video. Um, but Kara still uses that same method to clean these scat samples. They're more from our local area, not out off to Russia uh, for this particular study. But what they're doing is they go out there and try to find out what fish are around. They'll actually go fishing <laughs> to collect fish samples. Um, and then see what the sea lions have been eating in our area. And they're looking at sea lions that we see in our remote cameras. So we might even be able to uh, say within this population of animals that we've been watching, uh, literally individual animals for 20 years now, what kinds of fish are they eating? Um, so a more locally focused uh, diet study here with the Current okay, so I'll find I'm, I'm, I'm I might have that already on your on our resource page, but if not, I'll go and put it there now. That YouTube Fantastic. channel. Okay, well, thanks, Darren. We'll see you in a few days. All right. Thanks okay. a lot. And Mally, just thanks, real thanks. quick, did I see you booked at a, a second eater be eaten? So there's actually two in a row on I think it's May 25th. Was that correct? I'll have to look right, again. Okay. I've got one at 8.30 and one at 9.30 on May 25th. They're both in CILC, um, they're just right adjacent to each other. So um, okay. just maybe double check that, that that looks like what you intended to, to book. Just okay. to make sure. It's really fine Good for catch. us, I accepted them both, but. <laughs> I'll check right now. Okay, thanks, thanks Darren. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> okay, bye. Right. Bye-bye. It was great. Yep, see you guys soon.